welcome back to the Pursuit Podcast. Before we get started, I want to first say thank you to our sponsor, Nexamo. Nexamo not only allows us to keep operating this podcast, but they also supply developers with APIs for SMS, voice, authentication, and a lot of other really interesting tooling for developers. If you want to find out more about what they do, hop to Nexamo.com. If you want to thank them for sponsoring the podcast, say hi to them at Twitter at Nexamo Dev. I'm your host, Jessica Rose. I'm here today with Ian Coldwater. I'm a DevSecOps engineer and an ethical hacker. An ethical hacker. And that's very, very convenient because we are going to be talking about hacking today. First, talk me through what's an ethical hacker? Ethical hacker does a lot of the same things as any other kind of hacker. (laughs) Very diplomatic. (laughs) Some people like to use the label ethical hacker to differentiate themselves from people who might be inclined to do things like ransomware or cybercrime. Personally, I feel less concerned about that, but I use the labels so that I get fewer messages from people trying to get me to hack their ex-girlfriend's Facebooks. Oh, it sounds like you get to deal with some really different people. Yeah, it's great. Hmm. (laughs) So here we're just sort of using ethical hacker almost as a shorthand for probably not going to jail. One would hope. One would hope. (laughs) Hi, nice to meet you. I'm an ethical hacker no warrants, please. <laughs> I would appreciate it if you didn't, you know, pull me off. That'd be great. It <laughs> isn't necessarily that simple. Okay. Um, sometimes people, you get arrested for trying to responsibly disclose a bug or a vulnerability. Sometimes cases are complicated, like the one of Malware Tech Blog, who got arrested at DEF CON last year. But ideally, I think, you know, most hackers, really of any kind, would appreciate not being hauled off to jail. I think that's sort of a general thing. Like, as humans, we, we, we like to not be denied our liberties. Ideally. So that might be a really fantastic place to start, which is, if I'm not already an ethical hacker, if I, or, or if my dear listener is really interested in getting into this space, how do they get started, or where would they turn, which is going to leave them least likely to get arrested? So... I think that the best place to get started being a hacker is to figure out how things work. And it doesn't necessarily have to look like breaking computer software. Some of us, I think, who started out as kids, you know, have memories of taking apart electronic equipment and then figuring out how it worked and putting it back together. And I think that spirit, figuring out how it works, figuring out what makes it do that, figuring out how to make things do things that aren't necessarily what its creators intended, I think is really the spirit of who can be a hacker and what that looks like. So there's a lot of different ways to get started. Really just having that spirit, understanding how computers work, how software works, I think is a really good start. And from there, if you want to learn specific skills, it's a fairly wide discipline. There's a lot of different things you could learn. There's web application hacking. There's digital forensics for people who are interested in doing that. There's hardware hacking. There's different kinds of, um, there's different flavors there. You can just hack all the things. You can hack all the things. You can hack the whole planet. But what should we maybe not? What, 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 yeah. How about, how about a very gentle, maybe, maybe very cautious, oh, but please maybe not that. Okay. So some things that you can do to start if you're interested in learning how to, you know, hack computers are you could play capture the flag games, which are like competitive hacking games where the flags are not physical, like perhaps you need to go into a server and find them. There are a lot of sites online that are war game sites or CTF sites that allow people kind of a safe place to play and explore and be able to hone their new skills without necessarily touching anything that is going to get them in trouble for touching it. Because the thing about hacking is that often those skills, which I find very exciting and interesting, are often illegal, especially if you're touching things that you don't have permission to touch. And so if you can stick when you're learning to safer places to play, where you know that that is a space that you have expressed permission to do that, you can stay a lot safer while you're learning. Sort of get started in a sandbox. Yeah. So you used the acronym CTF. Can you talk about what that means for a moment? CTF stands for Capture the Flag. Ah, that was contained in there. I'm being very clever today. (laughs) Sorry for not explaining the acronym before. Clearly my fault. Uh, So we've actually gone ahead and sourced some questions from Twitter. And 
If you, dear listener, are wondering why you didn't get to be in this conversation, it's quite possibly because you're not following us on Twitter. You can check us out at at PursuitPod. So we've got someone who's asking about CTF, Capture That Flag, and they're asking, hey, or hello, hey, Ian, can you give some tips or some advice on Capture the Flag or on Hackathon self-care, how to take care of yourself when you've got maybe a grueling session where you're trying to win against the other team? How do you remember to take care of yourself as a sort of fleshy, meat-bodied, delicate, organic human? It's a great question. I'm not sure that I'm personally always as good as I would like to be. So very do as you say, not as you do. Self-care is very important and, and you should do that. Um, so I think one thing that you could do is I've heard some people set alarms for like, here is a time when I need to eat food or drink some water because that's what you need to do. Another thing that you can do is if you're playing with friends or if you have friends around, you can kind of be each other's accountability buddies with that and be like, Hey, you should get some food. I'm going to bring you some, you know, when they're like, no, no, I'm fine. And they're hacking away. It's like, well, we're going to have some sandwiches. I think that you should have a sandwich anyway. So you can bring your friend a sandwich and then, you know, a few hours later when you're doing the same thing, your friend can bring you a sandwich, stuff like that. Having snacks and food around, having water around is a good thing to do. And just trying to like pay attention to your body and also pay attention to your mind. Because if you're very tired and very hungry, often your decision making and your skills are not going to be as sharp. And it's not always easy to tell when that's happening. But if you start making a lot of typos and it's four in the morning, that might be a good sign that like taking a nap is a good idea. Cool. So to give our dear listener a little bit more idea about these capture the flag. So maybe our listener may have heard of hackathons before, which may be a single day or two days or a a whole weekend overnight. Do these capture the flag sessions also run multiple days or yeah, extended periods? There are a few different kinds of capture the flag games. Some of them, for example, if they're at a conference are certainly time boxed. You know, you have between the time that the server turns on and the time that the server turns off to get as many things as possible. Some of them are online and are just open. A good one that I recommend for beginners is Pico, P-I-C-O-C-T-F dot com, which is a game that Carnegie Mellon University puts on every year for middle and high school students. Oh, how fun. And I believe when the actual game is happening, it's time boxed, but they leave it up all year. And so you can register and still play it whether or not you were able to win or whether you were eligible. But that can be a really fun one for beginners. And things like that are just, you can do that on your own time. But the ones that are like the serious competitions, usually you do have a time limit. And they can get pretty intense. Oh, okay. In a way that I think can be appealing for some people and maybe less appealing for others, but it depends on the game. There's also different kinds where... There's something called Jeopardy style, which pretty much looks like Jeopardy. You have categories and levels of difficulty with different point values assigned to them. So you have categories like, for example, cryptography challenges or forensics challenges or binary reversing, things like that. And so those are really friendly to newbies, I think, because they have a little bit of something for everybody, regardless of skill level or their interests. And there's other kinds. There's one like attack defense capture the flag, where there's one team who doing the attacking on the network and another team who are in real time defending against the attackers. And so they have to patch things and be able to like chase them down and the other ones have to evade them. This sounds like a very plucky, very earnest nineties movie waiting to happen. Honestly, you know, I think it's a great time. It's one of, it's basically the only sport I've ever been good at. It's one of my favorite things to do. I am absolutely not qualified to make this decision, but I'm willing to make the ruling right now that this is a sport. I think it is. I consider it to be one. We've actually got another capture the flag question coming immediately after this is, what's a great way or what's the best way possibly to put together a great capture the flag team? What kind of capabilities do you want to look for? What kind of personality types might you want to bring with you if you're building your own team? In my experience, capture the flag teams work out really well when you have people who have diverse skill sets, especially if you know what kinds of challenges are going to be in the CTF itself. If you know there's going to be forensics challenges and reversing challenges and cryptography challenges and web challenges and pwning challenges, which are pretty common categories, then, you know, if you have a diverse team where somebody's really good at network, somebody's really good 
at web stuff, somebody else is really good at reversing, then people can concentrate on the things that they're good at and help each other learn, which can be a really fun thing. One of my favorite things personally with CTF games is the camaraderie involved. I don't always necessarily go personally with a team. Um, A lot of the time I'll go as an individual and kind of like join up and play with other people and not necessarily join their team itself, but have us like work together and learn together. And I've made a lot of really good friends that way. It's really fun. And I've learned from people with really diverse, different skill sets than mine. So I think that's really fun. But if you're putting together your own team, a diversity of skill sets, having everybody be curious and open to learning. And I think having everybody get along well, be easy to work with, especially at four in the morning when everybody is slightly tired and slightly hungry. I love that these are the exact same rules for putting together a really good pub trivia team. Pretty much. Oh, so this is a, maybe a gotcha question. This is a question that that looks really good written down, but I bet it's going to be really challenging to answer. We're moving away from the the glorious, friendly world of Catch the Flag and online games, and we've got a real world question. Okay. And we've got somebody asking, what do you think might be the single easiest or most effective security practice that you could implement in an organization or implement in a company or team? That's a great question. I think that one of the best things that organizations can do is actually threat model well. Okay. Because not everybody does that. And if you're approaching security without a threat model, you might be taking measures that you don't need to be taking or alternatively not taking measures that you might need to be. So threat modeling is like, what assets are you trying to protect and who might you be trying to protect it from? Like what might your adversaries look like? What are your capabilities in doing that protection and what are the capabilities of your adversaries in trying to attack you? And being able to figure that out can lead to different conclusions. Everybody's got a different threat model. Are you concerned about your intellectual property? Are you concerned about your physical space? What does that look like for you? And being able to answer that for every individual organization, I think, is a really helpful thing because it allows you to break down exactly what it is that you need. And after that, I think figuring out a security plan that aligns with your threat model and also honestly doing the basics. Talk to me about the basics. Okay, cyber hygiene. So washing your cyber hair and your cyber socks. Basically, yeah. You know, you would think that a lot of this stuff would be more common than it is, but, you know, make sure that your things are configured correctly. Make sure you're not using default passwords. Make sure you're not leaving your networks open to attackers in places where they can find them. You know, things like that. Practicing principles like the principle of least privilege, defense in depth, things like that. If you start approaching your networks with those kinds of security practices in mind, and especially align them with the threat model that you've come up with, I think that's going to be huge and is not always what organizations go about necessarily doing. Because even when you talk to security people, I like shiny zero days as much as the next hacker. You know, anybody who follows me on Twitter can attest. But a lot of the time, it isn't the shiny zero days or the advanced persistent threats that get you. A lot of the time, what gets you is things like leaving your server up with the default admin admin username password, you know, or things like that. Tired people who maybe miss the basics or people who maybe just don't necessarily know that they're misconfiguring their stuff. So figuring out how to do that in your org, I think is going to be the biggest single thing, or maybe that's a few things. I've got another very similar question. So we've got, what's the one thing I could do to improve? But somebody's also asking a really great one. What's one thing that's often overlooked that they could be, or that our dear listener could be shouting about or pushing about in their orgs next year? Do you want to make sure that everybody is like, go through all of your things and make sure that it's not admin, admin? If you had to send one message out into tech and be like, stop doing this thing. What's the thing? Oh, wow. That's a great question. For individuals, the thing that I always tell people is use a password manager and use two-factor authentication. That in and of itself can stop a lot of problems for for individual people and to some extent for orgs too. People reusing passwords is a really big problem. Organizationally, especially in places that, for example, have passwords that rotate every 90 days, if you or anybody else in your organization has passwords along the lines of spring 2018 exclamation point, which then transitions into summer 2018 exclamation point. I promise you that every hacker on the planet is well aware of that and they're trying that first. So if you're doing that, you should probably stop. Oh, at least <laughs> one of our listeners is suddenly feeling a little bit cold and lonely and afraid. Sorry about that. It's okay. Um, you've got time. And, 
I think that just trying to understand kind of the basics of security practices and like I said, doing that hygiene, I think that can look different for different orgs in terms of what people are a little better or worse at, but being able to understand security principles and educate each other about them and not in a shaming kind of way. I think in a, we're all in this together. We all are ideally a team working toward the same goals. We want to do this well. Let's do this well together and make it a project that is helping bring everybody up instead of people feeling ashamed and bringing people down. You mentioned passwords. And I think that from an individual perspective, this might be something to dive into a little bit more. And we got somebody who who asked a question about how do you use passwords? But I think that how would one choose passwords best might be the question I want to go into. I don't necessarily need to know your passwords because at least I know they're not summer 18 exclamation point. But as individuals... I couldn't even tell you my passwords if I wanted to because my passwords are all many, many characters that are randomly generated by a password manager. And I really do recommend password managers. Have one that's good, one that is good is LastPass, another one that's good is 1Password. Have a good one that works well for you and... I recommend using a password manager for most people. I think they're very friendly. And I think that that is going to make it so that you have the most secure password that's going to be the hardest for an attacker to get a hold of in a way that is going to be the simplest for you. So it's not just passwords. You've talked about two-factor authentication as well. Let's say our dear listener, or let's let's not put this on our listener. Let's say I have never heard of two-factor authentication. Can you talk me through what it is and why I might care about it and why this is the best thing since sliced bread for most people. Sure. Two-factor authentication is really important. It The idea is that instead of you putting in your password and then it maybe if you've forgotten it, it says forget password, maybe it sends it to your email and then you can reset it. That sounds great in theory, but a lot of people reuse passwords. And so as an attacker, if I have the password for your email, I actually have all of your passwords because I can go right into everything that you are signed up for and be like, oops, forgot your password. It will go right into the email that I have compromised. And then I've got a new password and I've got all your stuff. So ideally, you would like to avoid that. Ideally. Ideally. You know, just if you can. (laughs) Ideally. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. One way that you can avoid doing that is by using two or multi-factor authentication. And so instead of it being just like, okay, I've hit the button in the email, good to go. It'll, for example, send you a text message or have a different way for you to additionally authorize it for being you. Now, the thing about SMS two-factor authentication is that it's actually not that secure. It's more secure than nothing, but Reddit, I think, got hacked like they disclosed this like two days ago as of the time of recording here, where somebody compromised their SMS two-factor authentication. Oh, Again, it's better than nothing. If you if you have a choice between that and not doing two-factor auth, you should do that. But there are better, more secure ways of doing two-factor auth. One way is with an app like Google Authenticator. Another way is if you have a hardware key, like a YubiKey or similar that can allow you to do it that way. And those are the better, more secure ways of going about doing it. And to be honest, those feel a little bit more like the sci-fi future we were promised. So, okay, I'm going to put in my password. And here's, there's, I've seen people with YubiKeys. So YubiKeys are just little tiny hardware tchotchkes that you can say, hey, this is me. I have my physical thing. I've seen people put them in earrings. I've seen people put them in keychains. Like, yeah, this is the glittery cyberpunk future I wanted. Totally. And, you know, you can you can make them cute if you want to. They make them really small. There's something called a YubiKey Nano that is itty-bitty, like pinky nail-sized. Those are very easy to lose. And so I recommend putting it on a necklace or a keychain or something where you aren't going to lose it. Or some of them are made to just permanently live in your computer port, in which case you're unlikely to lose it. So if you've got a tiny one, put some glitter on it. Put some glitter on it. Put it somewhere where you're going to keep it around and know where it stays. But those can be a really useful thing. And YubiKeys themselves are a little bit pricier, but there are other alternatives that are cheaper that as long as they're certified, they work just as well. And when you say certified... The certification is called FIDO certification. Woof, woof. Like like the dog. Yeah. Um, (laughs) F-I-D-O. That certification 
is U2F or FIDO certifications can say that U2F stands for universal two-factor. Some of them are certified by something called the FIDO board, or so it'll be FIDO certified for adherence with universal two-factor protocols and standards to make sure that it works as well as it ought to. And so look for FIDO certified products and you can find them on Amazon for pretty. Now you're going to break my heart if this isn't true. Is there, is there a cute little dog sort of seal of, of certification? Not to my knowledge, but there, if there isn't, there really should be. <laughs> uh, if anyone here is working on the FIDO team, come on, get on this. So we've got another listener question that came in that I think you may have touched on very early in our, our discussion, but I'd love to dive into this a little bit more deeply. And we've got another Jessica asking, how could one learn security if you're not formally trained for it? I'd start by by breaking this down and saying, when you talk to folks who are ethical hackers, who are, are who are working in security, have most of them got a sort of degree in hacking? Um, cybersecurity academic programs and degrees are fairly recent, and people have been hacking for much longer than they've been around. So you have kind of newer folks who are coming into InfoSec with, which is information security, with degrees in cybersecurity or, you know, things like that. But that's a relatively recent development. And historically, when people started hacking computers, it wasn't uh, considered a discipline. It was figuring out how to make things work and figuring out how to make things work in the way that you wanted. So I would say the way to go about starting to train yourself is figure out what you want to do, figure out Information security is a very wide field with a wide range of disciplines. So figure out what it is that interests you and then go forth and play. Make sure you're doing it in a way that isn't going to get you into deep trouble right out of the gate. But you can go to learning resources like OWASP, which is the Open Web Application Standards Project. They have something called the OWASP Top 10 that explains, they update this every few years, the top 10 web security vulnerabilities, what they look like, how you can potentially test against them, as well as how those attacks work. That could be a good place to start if you're interested in doing web stuff. No Starch Press publishes a lot of books that are really good for various disciplines of hacking. Find those books, like seek out learning resources that are good. And then for me, I think I learn really well with immersion. So just getting in there, getting your hands dirty, working on that stuff yourself. See what happens when you touch this. If you're trying to break it, if you break it this way, what's it look like? If you break it that way, what's it look like? If you want to make it do this, how might you go about doing that? And with time and practice, you start to see common patterns. You start to figure out how things work better. And definitely it can help if you actually understand how things work first so that you don't have to figure everything out by trial and error. But that would be the two things I think that I would recommend the most is figure out sort of the, figure out how it works, figure out the basics of those disciplines, and then just go work on it. And there's a lot of information out there. Hackers are often very helpful and very excited about sharing what they know, especially with other people who are really curious and wanting to learn. There's a lot of people doing a lot of really amazing research and sharing it for free. Twitter is a really great place to find a lot of information about what's happening now, as well as research that people are doing. It's out there. If you want to find it, go find it. For me, I think it's really fun. And maybe you'll think it's fun too. Cool. So just good old fashioned, go poke around, explore things, don't get arrested and repeat. Exactly. So these are very great do's. Do get involved with some of these resources you've listed. Do start poking around and start maybe getting involved with some security communities or some hacker communities. If I did, or if our dear listener did, want to get stuck in and sort of start going to these events or start going to meetups or start hanging out with people that capture the flag games, what might be some sort of do's and don'ts of getting involved with the hacker community? Are there things that are like decidedly uncool? Are there things that I should absolutely look out for? That's a great question. So I think that meetups are great. I really enjoy going to hacker cons. I think they're a really great place to figure out what's going on and meet people. There are bigger kind of national ones. There are sort of medium-sized regional ones, pretty much regardless of where you live. And there are smaller local ones. Um, security B-sides happens in a lot of towns. It's worth taking a look at whether or not there's one in yours. And I think the biggest thing with approaching the hacker community is know that a lot of people are 
we're all nerds here. A lot of us are very excited about what we do and really excited to share with other people who are also excited about it. But I think that there is a lot of value placed on being curious, trying to figure things out yourself and not just begging to be spoon fed answers. So if you're new to Capture the Flag and you are trying to learn from other people, going at it kind of openly with curiosity and being friendly and humble about it, approaching it with the spirit of learning together, wanting to learn and figure it out yourself is going to get you a better reception than being like, hey, what's the answer to this? Because nobody wants to give you the answer to that. They want to help you figure it out, but they don't want to do it for you. So know that you need to do your own homework. And again, being humble, being friendly, curiosity is really highly valued in that community. And also just know that the hacker community is, it's been around for a while. It is sometimes an interesting, complicated group of people with an, impl- with an interesting, complicated history. And knowing that I've heard it compared to walking into a bar where all of the people have been regulars for a very long time and then inserting yourself into the conversation, there's going to be ways that are going to be maybe a little bit more well-received than others. So if you walk in, listen for a while, try to absorb the information that you're getting, try to understand what's going on before you kind of show up, stand on a table and say, I'm here, that I think can maybe have you be a little bit better received than doing otherwise. (laughs) You know, most of us are shy nerds, pretty much just like you probably are. And a lot of us are friendly. So don't be afraid to approach people and come in and learn with us. We're all in it together. I love how your capture the flag team building exercise was pretty much the same advice as building a good pub quiz team. And you're coming to a hacker event for the first time is kind of the same advice for trying to look cool at a high school party (laughs) as a high schooler. Like if you're trying to go to a high school party now, dear listener, unless you are in high school, unless you're in high school and that's fine. In which case, welcome to the show. Yeah. Sort of come in, read the room, be cool. Don't freak out immediately. Exactly. And and don't be afraid to be yourself. You don't actually have to like walk in with a hoodie and a ski mask. You can be you and you have a place there. If you are curious, if you want to figure out how to bend technology to your will in a way that isn't necessarily the way that its creators intended, if you want to figure out how to make things work and how to break them, that spirit of curiosity, that spirit of learning, you're welcome. Fantastic. If you're ready to be a magician and a destroyer of technological worlds, get into hacking. Ian, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. If somebody wanted to learn more about ethical hacking, learn more about your work, or just to follow you around on the internet in non-creepy ways, where could they find you? You can find me on Twitter at at Ian Coldwater, which is spelled just like it sounds, like Coldwater. Ian, thank you one more time. And dear listener, thank you for joining us. Come on back for our next episode. We'll have a brand new episode with a brand new, beautiful, interesting person just like Ian. 